Do you sometimes see a person when they get it, get like this light bulb goes off? And I sing like, oh, I've never seen it like that before. And these events come in smaller ways or they come in bigger ways, in wow moments. And some of these bigger wow experiences happen on a scientific level or on a political level or on a global level and the smaller oh oh now i get it happen on our personal level give an example the big revolution from geocentric to heliocentric worldview so ages ago people thought the earth is at the center of the universe some still think that way. <laughs> Some even think they are the center of the universe. And then Nicholas Copernicus looked at it and looked at it and tried to figure it out. And then Galileo Galilei with his telescope figured out there is something not right here. So. It's not you and I or the Earth that is at the center of the universe, but it's the Sun. And now we know the Sun is only the center of the solar system. And we're only a small little speck in our galaxy. And there are galaxies and galaxies, and it's kind of, wow. Revolutions like this happen, just like Newtonian physics, and then comes this theory of relativity and the quantum physics, and you think like, oh my dear, I thought this is how it is. And it blows my mind to kind of open up to that and explore it beyond the known. Transitions, revolutions like that happen in our faith world too. Sometimes we think, well, this is how it be. This is how it is. It's always going to be like that. Yes, there is something to that. There is a ground of being, something we can always fall back on. But there is also the opening up the experiences of the greater of the transformation of the warming of the heart. And one of those revolutions, changes in faith, happened to John Wesley. John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, uh, as an Anglican priest in uh, England, and later as a pastor here in the U.S., traveled. But before before he did all the traveling and the church planting and all, he had this experience, Aldergate Avenue in London. He went to a study that was about Luther, Luther's introduction to the, gospel, to the letter to the Romans. And he describes the experience later on. While he was participating and listening, his heart strangely warmed. And he realized a shift in understanding where he felt freed, saved, released, and could trust God wholeheartedly, and that Christ was the light of his life. And paraphrasing it a little bit, and we see these experiences in people, just like in John Wesley. We see them on a smaller scale, also our experiences, and we see them on a larger scale. And our gospel reading today describes one of those wow experiences. Peter, James, and John going up on the mountain, they see Jesus 
transfigured. It's almost like the glory of God breaks into their reality. They're terrified, they're shocked, they're in awe, they're awestruck, they're like lightning struck. And they're like, whoa, their lives will never be the same. Just like with Saul and Paul persecuting the church and then he gets this revelation, it's like lightning strike. He falls off the horse, you can almost think like off the high horse where he thought too high, he's tumbling down and it changes his life. Peter, James and John and we may have some of these smaller experiences, not at the scale of transfiguration, but on a smaller scale. What are some of those experiences? But I'm going first a little bit back to this transfiguration on the mountain. Jesus is changed and what happens from my perspective is that somehow, some way, this person, human person, as Jesus, down to earth, a rabbi, walking with them, teaching with them, they recognize that there is the divine God's glory with Jesus right there. So that Jesus is more than just the human being but there is the glory of God, the very presence of God in Jesus. And they hear and notice Jesus talking with Moses and with Elijah. Now, why Moses and Elijah? When we think of the Hebrew scripture, the whole Bible, our Old Testament part of the Bible, what is it? It's the law and the prophets. And Jesus says, in his teaching, the commandment of love, love God, love neighbor, love yourself, that sums up the law and the prophets. When Jesus taught, the Old Testament, our Hebrew scripture is Jesus' Bible. Jesus didn't have the New Testament to fall back on. Yeah, okay. So, Jesus lives from the Hebrew scriptures and interprets it and tries to put it back together and transfiguration happens for us when we recognize the law, the guidance, and law, the Old Testament law is best understood as God's guidance for our lives. There's good guidance there. Ten Commandments and much more good rules. And the prophets, Elijah stands for the archetypal prophet, who is lifting up the mirror and says, something is not right here. You got to do better. You can do better. Got to treat the poor people better. You can be more welcome. You can, there are some things just not right. And that's the whole prophet prophetic wing of the Old Testament. If you take only the law, it's like a bird with one wing. You don't get far. We need the prophet uh, part two. And Jesus is in conversation with the Bible at that time, the two parts. There is a third part, but that comes later. We'll get to that. And what Peter, James, and John hear is God's voice saying two things. One is, this is my beloved, so Jesus is loved. And that is the affirmation each and every one of us gets when we're baptized. Just like we heard in the children's message. Child of God, you belong to God, you're loved for who you are. And sometimes I have a hard time letting that sink in deeply because I think like, am I good enough? Do I live up to X, Y, Z's expectations? Am I whatever enough? And then we return to that source, to the core message, 
You're loved, you're valued, you are appreciated for who you are, no matter what. No matter what you believe, how you vote, who you feel like you are, orientation, all of that doesn't matter if you come to the core, to the source. You are God's beloved. The second thing they hear God's voice saying is, listen to him, listen to Jesus. And isn't that what we try to do here and overall in our lives? In conversation in between the law, the prophets, we see it through the center, trying to understand it most deeply through the person of Jesus, who he was and is and will always be, and how Jesus reflects the very light of God. And that's where we come to the epistle reading. Now, there were some typos going back and forth in between Margaret figuring out the right scripture reading. Typos started with me, went on to Linda, went on to Margaret, and it's kind of, okay, do the best we can with what we got. But yes, we got the transfiguration. The second story is where Paul writes to the church in Corinth that we see the glory of God reflected on the face of Jesus. It's reflected on Jesus. And the glory of God is placed into our hearts to shine and be reflected from us in our hearts. And it is this very glory of God who said at the beginning, let there be light and it becomes light. So the God from the very first day of creation, the God of the big bang, the immense universe, is shining into our hearts, into our lives. And our role, our job is to reflect that light. How do we do that? I remember being a little boy, I got these glow-in-the-dark things. And these were not like you twick them and they glow all the time. These were like, hold them to a light bulb. And then I ran to the basement door, <laughs> opened it up, closed it, and was looking. And that's what we are to do, to turn to the light, to be charged, and then to reflect that. How do we do that? Well, I think when we reflect and pay attention to those people and experiences who did shine on us, you are not who you are without those people who did reflect God's goodness, God's grace, God's beauty on you. Who are some of those people? who affirmed you for who you are, who loved you unconditionally. Just like that voice of Jesus on the mountain, heaven opens. When we know it in our bones, I am loved for who I am. That's what we are to reflect to others. There is something about the unconditional thing. I know that for me, often music speaks to my heart. Just the message of the music. Let me walk with you. Take my life. It's kind of, I wake up with a tune and think of, yeah, coming back to the source, shining on me, opening up, hoping for tr some transformation. So who reflected God's light for you? And how will you reflect God's light to others?